Thank you so much, Anna. And every, welcome everyone to our uh, Wage and Hour webinar. We're really thankful that so many of you are joining us. And in some ways, it's not really surprising either because we do have that free HR hotline that you're seeing on your screen right now. That's provided to you by the Riverside County Workforce Development in partnership with the California Employers Association. And so far since July 1st, 2023, wage and hour questions are tied for first when it comes to what employers are calling in for uh, right here in Riverside County. So this will be a great webinar and informative one for, for all of you. And we hope that you keep using this, this service, this HR hotline. It's free for you to use. And as long as we can show it's a great utilized service, we'll keep providing it to you for free. Uh, we've got great traction. We've seen uh, the number of calls in the past and it's doubled. So we're grateful that it's a useful service to you. And then just real quick as a, as a last reminder, you know, my team and I, we're here to help you and your business with any of your workforce needs, uh, whether that's attracting and recruiting, training and retaining, or even downsizing. downsizing. Uh, we do have programs, services, and funds that can help, uh, that we can help you tap into those. Uh, but we're, we know you're here to, to hear more about wages and hours. So I'll turn it back to Anna and we'll get the party started. All right, I love that, Jason. Let's get the party started. I like that. <laughs> so um, while this screen is on your computer right now, I really recommend taking a screenshot of this slide. Um, they are This slide is also included in your handouts, um, but sometimes it's just nice to have it in multiple places just for easy access to make sure that any of your questions you can just call into our hotline and ask. Um, also, um, if I can point your direction to, or point your attention, excuse me, to um, the chat box, I, I did just also drop in the PDF there if that's easier for you, but I will also uh, just make sure I double check and send that to you via email. So if you'd like prefer to get it via email, just drop it into the chat for there. Okay, so now I have the great privilege of introducing our trainers today. We are again fortunate to have two trainers. Uh, we have Jessica Hawthorne, our Senior Vice President, and Eli Nunez, our HR Director. So I know we have a ton to cover with lots of questions to probably answer, so it is all yours. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jason. Um, I will be kicking it off and Jessica will be hanging out in the chat box with any questions that come up during the presentation. Once again, I'd like to thank Jason and the Riverside uh, Workforce Development Board for having us host this webinar and again, remind you of that hotline too. We always love to hear from you with any questions related to HR, whether it's, you know, wage an hour, as you can, as you heard, that was taking the lead as far as uh, topics go or anything else, employee relations, whatever related, whatever it is, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you, love to help you out and, you know, help to take that burden off of you a little bit if, or help you with it at least. Um, and we are California Employers Association. Our goal is to provide our callers and our members with peace of mind. The way we do that is providing uh, compliance solutions, information, webinars such as this and any kind of support that we can. Basically, I like to say, you know, let us uh, help you out with the HR portion of the job so you can focus on everything else because we know there's a lot of things that go into running a organization or a company. So if we can help out the way we can, that's what we're here for. So we try to provide quick, responsive answers to HR questions. Uh, for members, we provide employment forms, policies, and we also have some for general general use on our website as well. So please take a, take a look, take a visit there. Uh, along with training for supervisors, managers, employees, and any kind of consultation for workplace issues and negotiations. Those are just some of the services we offer. But again, if you have any questions at all related to HR, give us a call and we could discuss it more in depth. Having said that, one thing that we are not, and I definitely am not, is a lawyer or a legal expert. So this presentation should be relied upon as should not be relied upon as legal advice. And we always recommend if you have any questions or issues of legal significance to you and your company, you consult uh, your own attorney or personal attorney. In this case, if you don't have one, we do have some that we work with uh, on our website as well that we could refer you to. But again, you know, this uh, presentation should be taken from an educational perspective. We're gonna talk about some guidelines, best practices, that sort of thing, but this is not legal advice. So having said that, we got all the fine print out of the way, if you will. Let's go ahead and jump right into what we will be covering today. First thing we'll talk about, we'll talk about some wage and hour fundamentals. Um, minimum wage, you know, it seems that it increases every year, sometimes twice a year in some locations. So we're going to talk about how that affects your hourly employees and your exempt salaried employees as well. Uh, business expense reimbursements, again, this is something that's been, you know, in everybody's mind, especially with remote work and hybrid work and that sort of thing. So we'll talk about best practices and what the state tells us we need to do there. 
along with meal and rest break and premium pay. You know, meal and rest breaks still continue to be a, a thorn in many employers' side, if you will. That's the way that um, a lot of uh, complaints and a lot of, you know, unfortunately, you know, legal actions begin with improper meal and rest breaks. And finally, final pay. You know, what do you have to do up, upon separation? What are your responsibilities and what does the state expect you to do as an employer when you are separating with an employee? And of course, what's the cleanest way to do that and stay out of trouble? So before we start, um, let's look at some of the places where we get our guidance when we talk about wage and hour. First one, of course, is the California Labor Code. I mean, this pretty much dictates almost everything, basically, as far as, far as it comes down to our employees, you know, how much we pay them, minimum wage, you know, when we, we're supposed to pay them, that sort of thing. So labor code is the big guidance as far as uh, wage and hour in the state of California. Another source is wage orders, and these wage orders can vary by industry. Now, your wage orders should be posted in the conspicuous place at your work at your work area. Usually, we like to see those, you know, by your labor law posters, which hopefully are up to date as well. And right now, if you're hearing about California wage orders and you're asking yourself, "What the heck are you talking about, Eli?" Give us a call after this uh, after this webinar. We'll be able to you know, help you out with that to make sure that you have the right postings and make sure that um, you are familiar with them, excuse me, because the wage order is going to vary by industry and basically affect things like such as exempt employees, overtime, that sort of thing, or could have an effect. So make sure that you're familiar with your specific wage order. Um, there are also local ordinances that could affect this. And, you know, being in Riverside County, Southern California, you know that different areas of Southern California can have some local ordinances that affect things such as minimum wage, paid sick leave, you know, um, you know, time off, leaves of absence, that sort of thing. So local ordinances can come into play and in some cases, um, you know, go beyond what the California Labor Code tells us. Basically, the state of California gives us law which establishes a floor. And then local ordinances can go beyond that and provide more benefits or more protections to employees. So pay very close attention to those if you are located in one of these um, municipalities that have different ordinances, or if you have remote employees that may live in these locations and work in these locations, because they could be subject to these ordinances and you may have to um, abide by them as well. And finally, we have case laws. You know, I mean, sometimes there's uh, you know, legal decisions that come down that actually change the way our California labor code is, or even the way it is interpreted, right? Different interpretations of uh, existing code or laws and how they can be applied to the workplace. So again, case law can have a very uh, serious, for lack of a better word, effect on our labor practices, labor law, and wage and hour in the state of California. So that let's talk about um, who was an employee. You know, wage and hour, we talk about wage and hour, we think about our employees, right? What we pay them, when we have to pay them, that sort of thing. So the state of California defines an employee as anyone who performs services for the benefit of an employer, and, and this can include minors and undocumented workers. Now, employees are not independent contractors or interns. That last one's a little tricky because in many cases, uh, you know, we may bring in people for the summer and call them interns, but pay them a wage. Realistically, if you're paying somebody a wage to perform work for you, they may be default into an employee rather than an intern and all the protections of an employee apply. So be very careful with that. If you are considering bringing interns into your workplace or you have interns, you have to make sure that they fit that um, classification which means you know, any, any work they do has to be for college credit, usually has to work through an accredited uh, educational institution in order for them to be true interns. And of course, if you offer them any benefits, salary, pay, that sort of thing, that again, can convert them into employees. And the thing to keep in mind is in the state of California, basically anybody that performs any work for you defaults to being an employee unless you prove otherwise. Now, this is important when we talk about things like independent contractors. A lot of times, you know, we like to think that, hey, we'll just bring, we'll just contract somebody for a short term, you know, to come in and help us out, and we'll call them a contractor, we'll pay them a set fee, and go on our merry way. Uh, this may have worked in the past, but uh, California basically put in place this, what they call an ABC test, which helps us to determine 
you know, if a person truly is an independent contractor. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the presumption is that all workers who perform work for you are employees unless they meet this criteria. And they have to meet, you know, any one of, any one of these can um, disqualify them from being what we call an independent contractor. So in this case, and in order for someone to qualify as an independent contractor, you have to be free of control and direction from the hirer. In other words, if you're bringing on an independent contractor, you're bringing them on to perform a project or to uh, you know get something done, but you're not going to tell them how to do it. So think if uh, you are a manufacturing facility and you need to bring somebody in to update your, I don't know, your server room or something, your computer system, you're basically going to contract somebody to perform that project, but you're not going to give them day-to-day, step-by-step direction on how to do them. You're not going to manage them on them. You are just going to pay them for and contract them for the project as a whole. Uh, next thing is they have to perform work that's outside the usual course of the hiring business or the hiring entity's business. In other words, if you run an accounting firm and you're short staff, you decide, hey, I'm going to bring in an independent contractor to sit next to Eli here and do the exact same work that he's doing. That work is not outside the course of our entity's business, and therefore that person would default to an employee, not a contractor. And finally, they have to be engaged in a trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as the work performed. In other words, their title or whatever you know they, they say that, that they do, the name in itself has no bearing on whether they're an independent contractor or not. It is the work that they're engaged in that is going to make the difference. Now, there could be some exemptions to the ABC test, as is always the case. You know, we talked about those, um, you know, court cases, legal cases, that sort of thing that have an effect. So if you think that something may uh, qualify as an independent contractor in spite of this ABC test, we always recommend you consult legal counsel to make sure. Because if you don't, things can get very, very expensive. So to the tune of a uh, minimum of Five thousand to fifteen thousand dollars for each violation, and a minimum of ten thousand dollars to a maximum of twenty-five thousand dollars per violation, if the state determines that you've established a pattern and practice of misclassification. In other words, if they see that you're doing it all the time or doing it as a general practice just to try to get away with things or save money, then um, the state can really, really drop the hammer. So speaking of employees, of course, we have uh, two classifications. We have our exempt employees, which we typically like to call our salaried employees, versus our non-exempt employees, which we like to call hourly employees. Um, I mean, this naming convention usually works to, to determine or to separate the two, even though there is there could be such a thing as non-exempt salaried employees. But to be honest, in that case, things get a little complicated, a little weird. So we'll just stick with exempt and non-exempt at this point. Now, exempt employees are exempt from most wage and hour laws. In other words, don't have to pay overtime, um, you know, meal breaks, that sort of thing. Clocking in and out, none of those things apply to exempt employees. Non-exempt employees, on the other hand, are not exempt from wage and hour laws, and they have to, you know, be eligible for to be paid overtime. They have to take their meal and breaks on time, that sort of thing. Now, as I mentioned, you know, in California, just like most people that perform work for you default to employees, the state of California also defaults employees to non-exempt unless you prove otherwise. How do you prove otherwise? We'll talk about that in a minute. But first, um, keep in mind that, again, it's not just in the job title. So we as employers cannot just determine, well, I'm going to make this person exempt, this person non-exempt, you know, this person I'm going to call a manager and make him exempt. It doesn't work like that. They have to meet certain requirements in order to qualify for that exemption. And uh, these specific qualifications include a couple of things. So for a person to be qualified as exempt, they have to pass the exemption test, which is a two-part test. One is a duties test and the other is a salary test. We'll go into detail about that in a minute. Um, thing about exempt employees to keep in mind too is they're paid a flat salary for their skills, their knowledge, for what they bring to the job, right? Um, sometimes we've gotten calls asking, hey, you know, we have this exempt employee that only works 20 hours a week. Can I cut their salary in half? Guess the, the default answer is there is no such thing as a part-time exempt employee. You're paying that exempt employee for their skills, their knowledge, 
you know, everything they bring to the job, not for their hours or for how many days a week they show up. You're paying them for the work, for, for the skill that they bring to the job overall, right? As I mentioned earlier, overtime, meal and rest, breaks, that sort of thing don't apply to them. And ultimately, if you have an employee that qualifies as an exempt employee, there could be fewer compliance issues to deal with. So that is what's so attractive about exempt employees, if you will. Non-exempt employees, on the other hand, typically paid by the hour for work performed and overtime laws do apply. They also have to take meal and rest breaks according to state law. And there are stringent record keeping requirements for non-exempt employees. In other words, clocking in and out, making sure they clock out for lunch, you know, a whole lot of things that come along with it. So again, be very careful as far as classification to make sure that your employees that are exempt truly are exempt because uh, misclassifying somebody can get really expensive to the tune of not just fines, but also back wages, penalties for uh, for waiting time to, to be paid correctly. All kinds of things can add up really, really quick. Now, some of these exemptions for those exempt employees include the exe executives or managerial exemption, if you will. And that's what we think about when you know we talk about managers being exempt or managers being paid salary instead of hourly. Um, another one is the administrative, and that's doing work that relates to management. So think like your HR generalist or, or that sort of thing. And finally, we have the professional exemption, which is things like um, lawyers, architects, that sort of thing. Anybody basically that needs to have a license or an advanced degree. Now, again, keep in mind, in order to fit in these exempt categories, it's not just about the job title. So in other words, for the managerial one, you can't just say somebody's title is manager and therefore they're exempt. A uh, question we always get asked a lot is in uh, you know dental facilities for the office manager. Well, this person's the office manager, so therefore they must be exempt. Well, not so fast. You know, we have to look at their duties. Same thing with, with administrative, right? You know, you could have somebody in there that uh, is maybe an HR administrator that greets people, that does paperwork, that files, but you say, you know what, I'm gonna call them a generalist. So therefore they fit the administrative uh, exemption. Not necessarily the case. So we have to look at um, a few different things to see if they qualify for these exemptions. First thing is, um, again, job title, I hate to say irrelevant, but that could be the case. You know, you can't just call somebody a manager and call them exempt. We have to look at their duties. What kind of work are they performing on a daily basis? And, uh, you know, the thing about that is you have to look to see what they're doing throughout their work day and their work week, right? The majority of their job duties must be engaged in those exempt duties. So in other words, a case that comes to mind is if you have like a supervisor in a manufacturing facility and they do a lot of work side by side with the production line you have to make sure that the majority of their time is spent in managerial duties. Because if, if they spend, say, 80% of their time on the production line with everybody else and 20% of their time making schedules and checking time cards, guess what? The majority of their time is not spent on managerial duties. Therefore, they would not qualify for that exemption. So next thing to keep in mind is, are they able to use independent judgment and use discretion? Are they able to make decisions? or make recommendations uh, when it comes to hiring, you know, evaluations, terminations, you know, raises, promotions, that sort of thing. You know, that judgment is very important. They have to be able to use that discretion in order to qualify for these exemptions. Again, I mentioned office managers, you know, just because the, the, the name or the word manager is in the job title doesn't mean that they qualify. We have to look at their job duties. And if you need any help with this, we do have exemption worksheets that you could work your way through to see if someone, you know, to, to do basically the groundwork to see if someone qualifies for these exemptions. Now we recommend if you have exempt employees, don't just call the position exempt, you know, and, and forget about it going forward. Keep taking a look at it. Look to see what the job duties involved and what that person is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Because as we know, job duties change, responsibilities change. And as these things change, that could affect that exemption. So keep an eye on it, revisit it, you know, periodically on a, or on a regular basis to make sure that that exemption is still true. Now let's talk about uh, minimum wage and salary because again, there is a salary requirement to ex to exempt employees as well. Now, first of all, 
you know, when we're talking about minimum wage in California, it seems that we're always talking about a minimum wage increase. And this all comes about thanks to SB3 or Senate Bill 3. This goes back to the Jerry Brown days, his second time in office, not his first. And basically what this does is anytime the uh, inflation or the cost of living is beyond a certain threshold, it automatically triggers an increase in minimum wage. Now, as you know, the past couple of years, the... Uh, yeah, inflation's been a little a little high, if you will. So it has triggered that uh, increase in minimum wage. That's why you jumped from fifteen to fifteen fifty last year to sixteen dollars per hour, effective January first of this year. Hopefully, those of you with hourly employees were aware of this and are paying them correctly. And hopefully, you have the updated labor law poster posted in your workplace, or you've at least ordered the new one and it's on its way. Now, the thing about the hourly um, non-exempt rate is that it also affects the exempt salary rate because state of california says in order for someone to qualify for their exemption they have to meet the duties test and that salary test and that salary test means that they have to make two times the non-exempt hourly wage per year in other words you take 16 dollars per hour you multiply it by two and then you multiply that by 2080 hours which is the equivalent of a 40 hour work week for the year so 16 times 2 times 2080, you come up with a magic number, $66,560. And a lot of times, you know, we, we, we saw people around the problems when they had supervisors that were right around the sixty to $65,000 range that were exempt. And then these increases come about. So you have to decide, am I going to give them a pay increase to stay above that threshold? Or am I going to convert this person to non-exempt? Now, it's always easier to go from exempt to non-exempt because remember, the state of California defaults everybody to non-exempt. However, you have to think of all the other steps involved and all the other things involved. So if you have a supervisor or somebody that was non-exempt or that was exempt, sorry, that used to work you know, 10, 15 hour workdays sometimes, you have to factor in that overtime. Is that overtime going to cost you more than what that increase could have? The other thing is, now this person that's not used to clocking in and out or taking meal breaks has to do that. How are they going to take that? A lot of people think, you know, feel like it's a demotion if they have to go from being exempt to non-exempt. May not be the case, but that's just kind of the feeling that people get sometimes when that happens. So we have to make sure that we're very careful with our messaging, how that message is coming across, how we're going to explain that to the employee, as well as giving the reason for it. So a lot of things to consider if you're thinking of going that way with a exempt employee. As I mentioned uh, about minimum wage too, uh, local there's a lot of local ordinances that affect it. And usually in some places we do see increases uh, mid-year, July 1st, a lot of increases take effect. I'm thinking of places like Los Angeles. I'm thinking of places like San Francisco. I'm thinking of places like uh, you know Emeryville up north. Those are the first ones that come to mind, right? And usually, like I said, they happen July 1st, but every once in a while, a county decides to go a little rogue on us. Last year, it was San Mateo County, I think it was, up in Northern California, decided that they were going to do an increase on April 1st. So what I recommend is, if you don't already do so, make sure you sign up for a blog anytime you know somebody tries to pull a little sneaky like that or, or do something, something out of the ordinary like that. We like to send a notice out. Also, we do have that bit.ly link there that'll take you to a spreadsheet that we've compiled that has the local minimum wages throughout the state. So take a look at them. And of course, keep in mind that local minimum wage is based on where the employee's physically working. So if you have, for example, a landscape business and you send people into areas that have a higher minimum wage or perhaps require a higher rollover for sick time or anything, be aware that since they are performing the work physically there, those ordinances may more than likely apply to them. Now, getting back to our exempt employees, I did mention that professional exemption where you have people like uh, you know, in, uh, architects, or in this case, we're going to talk about physicians or surgeons and computer software professionals. Well, the thing about them is they have their own uh, minimum wage established for these exemptions. So for physicians and surgeons, the minimum hourly pay for a licensed uh, person in those fields increased from $91.07 to $97.99 per hour. So sounds like it's good to be a physician or surgeon until you start considering that uh, med school tuition bill, right? 
The other one uh, is computer software professionals. Now, minimum hourly rate for them increased from fifty dollars to fifty three eighty. The monthly salary also increased, as well as the annual salary. So these all increase this year. Give us a call if you have anybody in these fields. Take a look to make sure that um, you've given the correct increase. Now, something about the computer software professionals too. These are typically people that are involved in. Um, Develop software development, software programming. We're not talking about your um, office IT person that helps out around the office, maybe set up new computers or to get things going for new hires or that sort of thing. So make sure that, um, you know, if you have anybody that you think qualifies for these exemptions, make sure that you are going through that worksheet and that they truly do fit into those categories. So, um, Talked a little bit about wage and hour. You know, we've been talking about exempt, non-exempt. Let's let's go into the realm of the non-exempt or hourly employees for a bit. Talk about overtime and regular rate of pay. Now, hopefully, regular rate of pay is nothing new to us. It's it's been around for a little over a year now. But let's let's revisit that and see you know how it affects our wage and hour practices for our employees. So overtime requirements pretty standard. We should all be familiar with them by now. Got to pay employees. You know, time and a half for anything over eight hours in a workday or 40 hours in a work week. And for the first eight hours on the seventh consecutive day in a work week. Um, you'll notice I emphasize consecutive day in a work week. We'll talk about why that's important. And then double time kicks in for any work over 12 hours in a work day or over eight hours on the seventh consecutive work day in a work week. So again, that work week language is very important because ultimately you get to define what your work day and your work week are as an employer. Now that doesn't mean you could change it every week or when things get busy or whatever. That means you define it in your handbook at the beginning and say, this is our policy. This is when our work day starts. Typically, I mean, the presumption that the state defaults to is that it starts at midnight and ends at 1159. You can shift that around a little bit though. And sometimes it makes sense to shift that around, especially if you have a graveyard shift or anything like that where you have employees that work through the night and you don't want to break their hours up into two separate work days. And those of you that have graveyard shifts that have that midnight breaking point know what I'm talking about. Payroll can get a little, look a little strange that way. So you can shift the start of the work day. Maybe if you have a, a shift that ends at two in the morning and the next shift doesn't start until four, maybe you want to say, Hey, you know what? Our work day is going to start at three in the morning and then that two fifty nine, that we capture all the hours on one day without having to break them up. Same thing goes for the work week. You get to pick any seven consecutive days that are going to be your work week. And again, this is going to depend on what your work week looks like. Do you typically work from Monday through Friday? Then the traditional Sunday through Saturday, which is what the state defaults to, is going to work for you. However, if a lot of your work week you know, constitutes starting on, thir on Tuesday and not ending until the following Sunday, maybe you want to shift when that work week starts. Again, that way you're not breaking up all the hours form the work week into two payroll weeks. So, and that work week also affects the uh, that payment of double time. Remember I mentioned the previous slide, then on the seventh consecutive day in the work week, the first eight hours are time and a half and anything beyond that is double time. Well, that has to be seven consecutive days in the same work week. So if your work week ends on Saturday, you could have a person start working on Monday and work all the way to the next Monday or Tuesday, whatever it is, and they would not hit that seven consecutive work days in the same work week. They may work, you know, 10, 12 days in a row, but as long as they're broken up into different work weeks, that rule that says, you know, on the seventh day, we have to pay time and a half for the first eight hours and double time beyond that will not apply. Now, regular rate of pay question we still get it once in a while. We used to get quite often when this first started was what is the regular rate of pay and why does it matter in calculating overtime? And basically the regular rate of pay is not to be confused with the base hourly wage. That base hourly wage is what we decide we're going to pay somebody when we are going to bring them on board, right? We say, we, hey, we're going to bring you on. We're going to pay you $20 an hour. Done. Deal. Welcome aboard. However, when we're talking about things like overtime or sick pay or anything like that, there are other things that could affect what the regular rate is or what rate we use. So if you pay your employees commission, piece rate along with their hourly wage 
or if you have shift differential, say for that graveyard shift or night shift again, or any non-discretionary bonuses, then these things can affect the regular rate that you use to pay overtime or to pay any sick time that is taken during that uh, by that employee. So how do you calculate that? Well, regular rate basically, um, you know, if, if you have anybody that has any compensation that pushes their earnings beyond that their their beyond their uh, hourly rate. So again, think of that graveyard shift. If you have like a, a shift differential, if you have any kind of uh, piece rate or anything like that, you have to factor that in. Um, when you're paying their overtime. So basically you take the regular hours worked, you take all their uh, all their earnings during that time, you know, and I'm talking about earnings, talking their, their regular hours and any kind of piece rate or any kind of, uh, you know, shift differential, you have to factor all that in to calculate their overtime correctly and to calculate that regular rate of pay correctly. Now I did mention bonuses. And bonuses, you know, the question is, are bonuses included when we calculate regular rate of pay? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> no, uh, really, it depends. It depends on the type of bonus. So if it's a discretionary bonus, in other words, um, you know, the owners or management team decides, hey, you know what, this was a pretty good year, and we're going to give our employees a bonus because you know things went well things went better than planned so at the end of the year we're going to give everybody you know x amount of dollars in that case that is what's called a discretionary bonus in other words it was up to a manager's discretion there was no program in place there was no you know set of um, targets that employees had to hit to get that bonus so that would not be factored into the regular rate of pay now, if it's a non-discretionary bonus in other words a plan bonus then yes you would have to factor it in so for example if you have like an attendance bonus where if an employee is not absent for, you know, for two months, they get this bonus, then technically that is a goal that you set for them. That is something they plan for. So that would make it non-discretionary. Same thing for production bonuses. You know, if you hit 5% over plan, then we will get, you know, this, this much as, as a bonus, then that is a non-discretionary bonus. So all of these would factor into determining the regular rate of pay. Another question we get when it comes to overtime is if I have, do I have to pay overtime if it was unauthorized? In other words, a lot of times we have policies that say, hey, you know, you can only work overtime if you get permission from your manager, from supervisor, from whatever it is. So all overtime must be authorized and the unauthorized overtime is not permitted. That's great in writing, but sometimes, you know, you have people that get carried away and really want to finish and work beyond their shift or, uh, you know, decide to heck with it i need some extra spending money this weekend so i'm going to work overtime so if they did it without permission do we still have to pay it and i hope you know of course the answer is yes we have to pay for all worked hours whether they were authorized or not so what can you do if you have an employee that works in authorized overtime well first thing is hopefully you have a policy about it so we're going to remind them that they need authorization before working overtime and remind them of the steps to get that authorization, whether it's a you know written request, whether it's verbal, who they talk to, etc. Now, if they have a mistake on their time card, make sure that they know how to correct that, who they talk to, you know, who they go to to fix these mistakes. And finally, if it's something that happens and possibly happens over and over, you've coached people on, make sure that you are disciplining them correctly. So if you have a policy about it, you can rely on your policy to issue corrective action to address the issue. Otherwise, if you just ignore it, guess what? It's almost like you're condoning the behavior. And next thing you know, you have a free-for-all where overtime is through the roof. So again, we do have to pay unauthorized overtime. However, we can address it from a disciplinary standpoint. Just make sure you have a policy that addresses that and how you deal with uh, overtime as a whole. So a few tips when dealing with overtime, of course, make sure you're working with your payroll provider. If you have a, a third party that does your payroll to make sure that they use regular rate of pay. This has been you know, practicing the state for a bit now, so they should be doing it, but just make sure that they know about it. 
especially if you have bonuses or that sort of thing, make sure that they know when they should be factored in and when they shouldn't. Your payroll provider, usually you're paying them a good amount of change to handle payroll for you, take that worry off of you. So they, they're your partner. Make sure that they're taking care of you and doing things correctly. Next thing is we don't want to complicate that regular rate calculation by using all kinds of additional compensation. So worked at places that had um, shift differentials, they had piece rate, they had production bonuses, they had production goals where, you know, different kickers came into play and everything. And next thing you know, the payroll person is not looking too well, right? They're not very happy about it. So again, just take a look at what your compensation is. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't start throwing a bunch of different, you know, different uh, kickers in there, different, different triggers in there to raise it because at the end of the day, you know, it's going to affect your overtime. It's going to affect how you handle paid sick leave. So you are going to end up paying for it regardless. You might as well simplify it as much as possible. That way the employee understands. That way you understand. Less of a chance for mistakes. And finally, if you have any questions, you know, give us a call. When it comes to regular rate of pay, what, what affects it? How do you figure it out? You know, what's the calculation? That sort of thing. We can help walk you through that with a few examples if, if you need additional help with it. And next topic I'd like to discuss, too, is alternative work weeks. Now, when we talk about overtime, I didn't mention anything over eight hours. It's paid a time and a half, et cetera, et cetera. And those of you that possibly work a different schedule, maybe you work 410s or 312s or a 980 schedule, you're probably thinking, well, that doesn't jive with what we're doing. And that is okay. Alternative work weeks do allow employers to basically change these things a little bit, right? However, we have to make sure if we're going to alternative work week that it's implemented correctly so that we are not shorting our employees any overtime due. So the thing without um, altern or about alternative work weeks, it's, it's the same as with exempt employees. We can't just decide one day, you know, wake up and say, hey, you know what's a great idea? Shifting everybody to four tenths and we're starting next Monday. My friends, I wish it was that simple. It is not. So, First thing you want to do if, if you're considering going to alternative work week, take a look at your wage order because that can have an effect on what you can implement into your specific industry. So some of these other requirements, first thing you have to do if you're considering going to alternative work week, you have to put this proposal in writing. Who do you put in writing to? Well, management, of course, and to your employees. You have to hold at least one meeting with your employees and provide them a disclosure and give them the opportunity to vote about whether they want to go to an alternative work week or not. Now, there's a secret ballot, and at least two-thirds of that work unit must adopt um, the change in order for it to come into play. Now, what do I mean by work unit? That means that if in an organization, if you decide to go to an alternative work week, you can do it on a department basis. You could do it for certain you know, jobs, you don't have to do it across the board for everybody. So you're looking at work units. Work units can be as small as one person or as large as you know, a thousand people, whatever it is. So once you hold the secret ballot vote and it passes, you're going to report your election results to the DIR, and then we're going to wait. And waiting is always the hardest, right? But we have to wait at least 30 days before we start that alternative work schedule. Why? Because we have to make sure the DIR receives our election results, approves it, posts it, says, go ahead, move forward, you're good to go. So once that's the case, then we create the schedule, roll it out, and make sure that our employees understand it and are ready to go with it. So with that, that brings me to pretty close to the halfway point here. Um, I'll bring up Jessica, see if we have any questions floating around out there anything we need to address or anything for the group to hear no i think we got them all a couple of folks i did direct you back to the hotline because it's hard for me to put everything in place while also answering questions so i apologize if i didn't answer your question directly but that will be the best way if we're not able to help you during the webinar you still have that great resource that jason told you about um, so let me get this set up so we can move on. But I, I think you covered everything, Eli. So okay. I will get a rolling. I will go behind the curtain then. Okay. All righty. So we're going to shift a little bit. Eli really laid the foundation for us on proper payment, 
who needs to be paid hourly, who needs to get these meal and rest breaks, and how precarious it can be if you decide not to have somebody who's not exempt is you have to prove that you are right. And the problem with that can be you're not tracking things like meal and rest breaks, clock in, clock out. And so it kind of sets the employer up for failure if you're going to be wrong. So it's really important that you assume that everybody is hourly not exempt unless you're 100% certain that they are exempt from the wage order requirements. So an important wage order requirement for your hourly non-exempt employees is going to be those rest breaks. And the language that courts have used and the wage orders use is employers are required to authorize and permit rest breaks, which means make sure you have a policy on meal and rest breaks, make sure you tell everybody who is hourly non-exempt that they have a right to those rest breaks and that you don't impede their ability to take those rest breaks. So rest breaks are a little bit more challenging because they're paid. People aren't clocking out. So you do wanna verify that people are taking them. And you can either have a checkbox on your timesheets. A lot of timekeeping systems have a way to say, yes, I was provided all of my required rest and meal breaks during this pay period. Making sure supervisors are saying, hey, if you miss a rest break, you need to let me know. And I, I need to know why, because we wanna make sure we don't owe you extra money. Because if somebody misses their rest break or if their rest break is beyond say the four hours, then you owe them one hour and it's called premium pay. So premium pay is at the regular rate of pay and it has to be paid in that time period. So if people aren't able to take it or if a supervisor doesn't let somebody take it, we're gonna owe them that extra hour of pay. So another thing that's really important around rest breaks is our Department of Labor Standards Enforcement, that's the Labor Commissioner's Office, which enforces all of these rules, says, in addition to make sure employees can be completely relieved of all their duties for this 10 minute rest break, they can't be required to be maintain themselves on the premises either. So a long time ago, or a few years ago even, a lot of people would have a policy around rest breaks is you get a 10, minute rest break. It's paid time. Therefore, you need to stay on site because that's still controlled time by the employer. And there was a case and then the labor commissioner's office said, yeah, if you're controlling that time, they're not getting a meaningful rest break. So if you make them stay on the premises, then you're violating the wage order and the labor code. So you do want to make sure they can leave. You want to make sure it's clear they do need to be back within that 10 minutes. If you provide more than 10 minutes, you're welcome to do that, but we're only required to provide 10 minutes. So if somebody works three and a half hours, they're gonna need zero rest breaks. So think about you know if you have shorter shifts, three and a half to six hours, only one rest break, 10 minutes on the clock, but they can leave the premises. Once we get over six and up to 10 hours of a shift, we get two, over 10, we're getting three. So three is the max 10 minute rest breaks that somebody will get in a day. And meal breaks or lunches, you know, it's kind of a misnomer because it really has nothing to do with food. It's just an obligation on us as employers to allow employees to take 30 minutes of uninterrupted time to do whatever they want around the middle of their shift. The only time that somebody does not need a 30 minute meal break, which is unpaid, so they, they have to clock out and then clock back in, at the end of that 30 minutes is if their shift is gonna be done in less than six hours and they sign a waiver or they don't work more than five hours. If they work four hours and 59 minutes in a day, they do not need a meal break. Once they go over that five hours, that's when we're in meal break territory or we're looking at waivers. We say four hours and 59 minutes into their shift is when that meal break should begin because the way that the rule is written is very, very confusing. It says it must start before the end of the fifth hour or the start of the sixth hour. So the sixth hour is actually five hours in. So four hours and 59 minutes in the shift, no later than that can that meal break start. So be aware of that when you're scheduling people. So if somebody starts at 6 a.m., their meal break, their 30 minute meal break must be no later than seven, eight, nine, 10, 59 a.m. So keep an eye on that when you're scheduling people 
and when they start those breaks. They must be fully relieved of all their job duties for that 30 minute period to get their meal break. And if they do work more than 10 hours in a day, they're gonna need two meal breaks. Okay, so that was a similar example that I just gave you. If for some reason they're not able to get their meal break or the employer or supervisor impedes their ability to take the meal break, even by saying, you know, people who work hard don't need to take a meal break. Well, we have to have them take a meal break because if they don't, it's another hour of premium pay at their regular rate of pay that we as the employer are gonna to have to pay this employee. <clears throat> so it's really important that people get the meal breaks. The meal breaks are uninterrupted. Now we do get the question a lot, what if the employee just doesn't take it? They just blew it off, they didn't feel like taking it. There was nothing that the employer was doing that limited the employee's ability to do that. Well, I would step back first and when somebody is hired and maybe once a year, have them sign off on your meal and rest break policy. Just remind them all the requirements. There's no reason for you not to get that meal or rest break, please take it. If you can't take it, let your supervisor know as soon as possible. That way, if somebody does just blow off their meal break, I didn't feel like taking it, I didn't need to take it today, you remind them of the policy you, and document that the employee stated to you, I had every ability to take my meal break, but I just didn't feel like it. Only in that circumstance is when you don't have to pay that extra hour of pay. But make sure you're really clear that the employee actually was not impeded or somebody wasn't limiting their ability to take that meal break. And of course, when in doubt, pay the premium pay. But there are mechanism, me ooh, pardon me, mechanisms in place that you can create that can limit your liability for these uh, meal, missed meal and rest breaks. So I mentioned briefly before that you can waive a meal break, the 30 minutes where you clock out and clock back in. The first meal break, as I mentioned before, let me get back on this slide, you get one meal break if you work over five hours and less than 10, you get two meal breaks automatically <clears throat> once you go over 10 hours of hours worked in a work day. So that first meal break, or if you're never, if that employee is not going to work more than six hours, they can waive it. And I would get that in writing. I would use caution with waiving a six hour shift because once somebody goes over by 601, that penalty is going to kick in. So if you're going to try to enforce the waiver for shifts less than six hours, I would schedule people for five hour shifts. That way, if they go over, you're still okay. So that first meal break can be waived. A second meal break, remember if I'm working over 10 hours, I get two. Everybody should agree, put it in writing, sign off on it. The employee took one meal break already and their shift will be done in less than 12 hours. If all of those things happen, then they only have to take one meal break and they can waive the second. So make sure if you are doing waivers of meal breaks, you know what kind of shifts you're scheduling people for, and that you're putting everything in writing so you can document it very clearly so you have that paper trail. <clears throat> we also get the question about rounding practices. So a lot of people have uh, time trackers that will round time. Like if somebody clocks in 8.01, it'll round it back to eight o'clock. Or if somebody clocks out at 5.03, it'll round it back to five o'clock. So with meal periods, one of the questions we get is, can employers per round that 30 minutes. So let's say I clock out for lunch at 12.01 and I clock back in at 12.29. Depending on the rounding, I may not get a full 30 minutes in that time clock. And so we got this case a couple of years ago now, um, Donahue, the Donahue case that said explicitly, you cannot round for meal periods. It must be a precise 30 minutes minimum from start to finish that the employee gets that meal break. So keep an eye out on your system. Most, and part of the judge's position on this was, look, we have pretty sophisticated timekeeping systems these days. I think we can figure out a way for people to get a 30 minute meal break from start to finish. So take an eye out on your um, timekeeping systems and make sure you're not rounding, especially your meal breaks. Because years ago, with the seized candy case, 
California Court of Appeal was like, yeah, I mean, the federal rule allows for rounding, will allow rounding as long as it's consistent and that over time it errs to the benefit of the employee, meaning you're not always rounding forward or always rounding back. Over time, it basically evens out and it's neutral. And so employees aren't really um, disadvantaged by the process. Well, that changed in 2022 with the Home Depot case and the Court of Appeals said, look, you actually have one of those timekeeping systems that does it minute by minute by minute. So there's no reason for you to not get rid of that rounding practice. And they did some forensic analysis and the employee was not paid for all the time that they actually worked. So if you do rounding in your timekeeping system, please talk to your payroll provider or whatever system you use and that practice because it is consistently being challenged and beyond frowned upon at this point to round time. And um, what's ending up happening, if your employee is underpaid, then you have those significant penalties and nobody wants that to happen. Okay, some meal and rest break deal breakers. Bare bones compliance with meal and rest breaks, you have to relieve people of all duty. There's no like chit chatting or, you know, can you go grab me that file real quick or anything like that. You really need to let them go. Um, and I, I used to work in a place that was filled with cubicles and you could always tell when people were on their meal or rest break is because they would have a sign hanging on their cubicle. And that was wonderful because then you knew not to interrupt that person. So if they're on their meal break, I'm not going to interrupt them because that's against company policy. You also have to relinquish control you can't tell them to stay on the premises. You can't tell them how far they can go, all of those sort of things. You really want to make sure people have an opportunity to take those meal breaks. And what that means is, hey, don't forget, you've got to take your break by such, a, such and such a time or making a schedule if that's necessary or, you know, tailgate meetings once a week saying, you know, schedule your meal break so you have enough time to take them. There's no reason for you not to be able to take that meal break. You also want to make sure people can take track, keep track of those meal and rest breaks, sign off that they took the rest break and making sure that they clock out and then clock back in for their meal break. If you have hourly folks working remotely, make sure they're aware that these rules apply equally to them. They still need to take that meal break even if they're working remotely. And again, see if your payroll system can have a box or a digital signature where an employee says, I was provided all required meal and rest breaks. So premium pay, and we just talked about that a little bit with the meal and rest breaks, but there's a lot of things in wage and hour world here in California that will be considered premium pay. So missed meal break, missed rest break, missed heat recovery break. These are all times when that premium pay is owed. And that's if the employee wasn't able to take it on time, that break was interrupted, it was too short, it was rounded, or it just wasn't taken because the employee had to do something for work or didn't believe that they could take the break. Any of those things happen, we're gonna order, we're gonna owe that employee one hour of premium pay at their regular rate of pay. So you pay for all the time they worked, and then you have that hour of premium pay on top of all of the time that they worked. <clears throat> so it's a maximum of three hours a day, rest break, meal period, and if heat recovery is owed. So three could be a maximum of three hours if we're not giving employees those mandatory breaks. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is part of our labor code that Eli referred to at the beginning of our meeting today. But that is that one additional hour of pay if something's not provided or unable to take or even interrupted or impeded. So premium pay, is it considered wages? And if so, why is that? Why does that matter, right? So we had a case a couple of years ago, which said, yep, all of that premium pay is considered wages. And the reason why that is so important is it needs to show on um, the employee's wage statement. So that, you know, that pay stub that nobody looks at anymore is still required. And it has a lot of things that are required to be on it. And one of them is premium pay. And it gets very pricey if your wage statements are not accurate, if anything's missing from them. 
The other reason why it's important to know that premium pay is considered wages is it has to be timely paid out, meaning each paycheck. And if somebody leaves your employment and they're owed any, owed any premium pay, that needs to be paid in that final paycheck in a timely manner. And if it's late or wrong or just missed all together, you're going to get those waiting time penalties. And we'll talk about waiting time pen penalties more a little bit later, but that's the equivalent of one day's wages for up to 30 days. So very expensive. I mean, consider premium pay, maybe say $32 an hour or, you know, one thirty-two hour, $32 payment for one day that was missed. And it's, if it was never paid, then the employee can file um, a claim that their final pay was incorrect because they weren't paid for that premium pay. So, Make sure you're aware of those different premium pay requirements and make sure they're treated as wages, paid out in a timely way and included on those wage statements. So these are all the things Labor Code Section 226 requires us to have on our wage statements in California. So gross and net wages, the total hours worked, exempt people, you don't have to have total hours because nobody tracks their hours and it doesn't matter how many hours they work. We need to see the hourly rate of pay and the number of hours worked associated with that particular hourly rate. So if you pay multiple rates of pay, like travel time is a different than actual work time, piece rate impacts this. You have to have the actual hours worked and the hourly rate associated with that. So every minute that was worked that the employee was on the clock needs to be compensable at at least minimum wage. You have to include all the deductions, the employee's name, your employer's legal name and address needs to be on that pay stub, the date of the payroll period, some identification number. If you're gonna use social security, just the last four digits. You need to have the paid sick leave balance either on that wage statement or a separate document with the wage statement. And piece rate, number of piece rates earned and any applicable piece rate and make sure that people are earning at least minimum wage for every minute that they're working. So if somebody works a full hour and their piece rates only add up to $14, you're gonna be under minimum wage. So you need to make sure everybody's earning minimum wage for every hour that they work. So here's a mock-up of what a pay state, page pay statement should look like. So you can see all the information that we just went through. Paid sick leave is an important one. Make sure that accrual is showing properly. I know a number of people, people they submitted the information to their payroll provider, but the first pay stubs for this uh, for 2024 didn't accurately reflect the new accrual rate. So make sure you're checking to that the accurate accrual rate is in effect because that changed for 2024. All right, expense reimbursements. This is a sticky wicket. Um, we are required by the labor code to reimburse employees for all necessary expenditures or losses. So anytime I have to spend my own money or use my own resources to do my job, my company needs to pay me back a reasonable amount for that usage. So we love that word reasonable, don't we? Because nobody knows what it means. But we have some general idea from some case law and the labor co commissioner on what a reasonable re reimbursement is depending on the circumstance. And to be clear, wage re or reimbursement of expenses applies equally across the board. It's unrelated to somebody's compensation. So you, know, you have an exempt employee that drives to the airport you have to pay them for their mileage to get to the airport, but you don't have to pay them extra time because they drove to the airport. Whereas a non-exempt employee, you're gonna pay beyond commute costs, wages, and you're going to pay for that mileage to get to the airport. So personal cell usage. I mean, who doesn't use a cell phone anymore? And a lot of people either have a work-related phone or they use their personal phone for work-related business. And we are required to reimburse employees for all work-related usage of their cell phone. And yes, even if somebody has unlimited data, we have to come up with a reasonable percentage of that bill that we're going to 
pay based on the amount of time approximately the employee is using their work phone or their personal phone for work-related reasons. So for example, let's say I have an unlimited plan. I pay $100 a month. I work full time. I only use my personal phone for work-related reasons. I have customers calling me. I have clients calling me. I do research on it. So I'm using it fairly regularly throughout the workday. And my company expects me to be available by, by a cell phone. So there's typically about 20 work days in a month. That's two thirds of a month. But then part of the day is only about two thirds of the day. So you just start breaking down the math and then come up with a reasonable amount saying, you know, it sounds like you maybe use your work related phone 35% of the time. So we'll pay you $35 a month for the use of your cell phone. That's one way to do it is to come up with a reasonable percentage for the use of that time. So find out, start tracking it, ask employees to sort of get a general sense on it. And then another option is just to kind of come up with a reasonable amount across the board. You look at what all the expense reimbursements are over a certain period of time. The average is about here. So we're gonna round up just to make sure that's inclusive of all different types of plans. And we're just gonna give everybody a stipend. That's another option. So long as you are reimbursing people a reasonable amount. Same with your personal vehicle. As I mentioned, you know, you're driving to the airport using your own personal vehicle. You should get reimbursed and you're required to be reimbursed under the labor code for your expense to use your own vehicle. What our labor commissioner says is we're gonna use that IRS rate as a reasonable amount for use of somebody's personal vehicle for work reasons. And the reason being is the IRS has already done all the algorithms and the math to say, you know, insurance, gas, upkeep, value of the car, all these things. And they come up with this amount each year. It's very exciting every year in December when that comes out. So for January, 2024, the IRS mileage rate is 67 cents per mile. So that is the amount that the labor commissioner will want to see you using. You can use a different amount, a lower amount. You can do a higher amount too, if you're crazy like that, but you can do a lower amount but then you will have the burden as the employer to prove that that is a reasonable reimbursement amount. And that's hard, I, that's challenging to do. And as I mentioned earlier, earlier, if a non-exempt employee is using their personal vehicle for work reasons, that is also compensable time. So you're reimbursing expenses and you're paying them back, <clears throat> paying them for their time. As far as losses and damaged property, this is a very interesting area, but for the most part, it can't cost an employee anything to have a job. And it, and it actually says something like that in the labor code. Like, you know, if something inadvertently breaks or gets destroyed while I'm working, that's the cost of doing business in California. And we cannot get that money back from an employee. So, and that's negligence. Now, there are other things where it's more willful or dishonest acts or gross negligence, like, you know, somebody drove a truck into somebody's garage door. Um, one of the famous stories is um, a painter got all the work orders, saw the paint, the client signed off on the color paint, all that sort of stuff. And he decided he was going to paint the entire house a completely different color. That was a problem. And he was terminated and he needed to reimburse the employee, employer for that amount. So, but be careful. Like it sometimes we don't know what gross negligence is. And if we take money back from an employee for that reason and we're wrong, it gets very expensive for making deductions from people's pay. So talk that out with somebody before you start taking money out of people's paychecks. So this question has come up a lot as our world has evolved to more hybrid or remote work. So an employee is permitted to come to the office anytime, but they're choosing to work voluntarily, meaning you've got enough workspace in the office, but you're fine if they work from home as well. So do you need to reimburse them for their home office expenses? And you can put in the chat <clears throat> what you think. All their costs, I just need to give them a laptop and our phone, or it's voluntary. I don't need to reimburse anything. 
because they can come to the office if they need a computer. They can come to the office for whatever reason. So do all, some, or none. All right, so I see B, only need to provide a laptop and phone. And you know, it's a bit of a trick question. We do this, keep ourselves awake and hopefully you as well, but we don't know because the labor code just says reasonable and necessary. So if I need a laptop and a phone to do my work, does that mean I also need internet in order for my laptop to work? Probably. Does that also need, mean that I'm using more power, you know, more gas and electric from my home because I'm doing work? And it starts getting into this crazy snowball, right? And the courts are not answering this question for us at all. So some of the advice that we've been given and the guidance that we've determined is the best practice is just have a very clear remote work policy. What's mandatory? What's voluntary? How much time? What are you going to be reimbursing for? What property, what equipment you're going to provide? And then come up with a reasonable amount. And you can do it employee by employee if you want. You can, again, you can also look at expense reports, you know, past six months, past year, and come up with an average and say, it sounds like we're reimbursing about X amount of dollars for people who work two days or more from their home office. So we're going to just come up with a stipend. So there's different ways to do it, but having everybody just kind of agree that this is going to be a reasonable amount, because in all honesty, the, the folks working from home a couple of days a week, it may be more convenient for them. They're not spending gas. They're getting extra time. So there's a reasonableness on both sides on this. So have a very good policy on this and come up with a reasonable amount based on data and pay it as a stipend, or you can do actual receipts. You know, we'll pay 50% of your internet and we'll pay 20% of X. So there's different ways to do it. Just be consistent across the board and have people sign off on it, agreeing that it's reasonable. And also saying, if things change, the amounts change and maybe it's not reasonable anymore, it's on me as the employee to bring it to your attention. So the other part of this is, what if you really want this to work, if you don't want people working remotely, more power to you. But if you want really want it to work, this hybrid or fully remote, just come up with what's reasonable, what equipment you're generally gonna provide. If you do go the stipend route, do be aware of stipends are taxable income, whereas expense reimbursements are one-to-one. -one. Like I'm going to, I went out to dinner, here's my receipt, I get paid back. Stipends, because they're not directly related to an actual expenditure, are gonna be taxed. So there's different implications there too. You just need to kind of think about what works best for your company if you wanna go the remote or hybrid or work from home route. Okay. Check your county and city minimum wage laws. Uh, as Eli said, we had a good run about a year and a half where everybody was on a January or July. And then last year, somebody, yeah, somebody in I think the Bay Area now has an April 1. And the reason why that's important, Riverside County, you guys follow the state, but if you have a remote worker that's in one of these localities with a higher minimum wage or maybe a local paid sick leave ordinance, you're going to want to know that because if somebody's working there, you've got to follow those rules. Really, really strongly recommend remote work agreements. Make sure wh what is remote work? What's hybrid work? Do we have different classifications? If you work remotely 50% of the time, you'll get X amount as a reasonable expenditure reimbursement. If you work less than 50%, what do all those things look like? Reminding people also all of your policies apply equally, regardless of where they work, harassment prevention, meal and rest break, you know, all of those things apply equally. And, you know, if you're going to come up with some number for a reasonable reimbursement amount, make sure the employee is signing off agreeing to the reasonableness of that amount. Keep an eye out on what your exempt employees are making right now. Remember, it's very high. $16 times two times 2080. That's the amount that your exempt people need to be making at a minimum. And then more likely than not, based on inflation, it, the minimum wage will go up again 
in 2025. So start looking ahead now if you have folks on that lower end of the minimum salary scale. As Eli said, it's it's an adjustment to go from exempt to non-exempt. So if you see that somebody is making 68,000 right now and you don't want to bump them significantly higher than that for 2025, maybe start thinking about it now and working on it now. I know it's only February, but it is an adjustment and you don't want employees to feel like it's a demotion. You just want you want them to understand this is a compliance issue. And we want to make it as easy as possible for everybody. So final pay, I cannot emphasize enough how important getting final pay accurate is. It is low hanging fruit as they like to say in the biz, but when you terminate an employee, an involuntary termination, you're fired. That money, all those wages, any money that they've earned through that day, any overtime they've earned through that day, any premium pay for missed meal, rest, recovery periods, anything that they have earned as wages must be in their hands when you say you're fired. Can you do direct deposit for final pay? Yes, but only if the employee specifically authorizes direct deposit for final pay. You cannot rely on the direct deposit they signed when they were hired. And it is not recommended that you just throw in there and final pay by direct deposit is fine as well, because if the employee changes their mind at some point, and you're late paying that final pay, like I said earlier, that waiting time penalty is one day's pay up to 30 days. So even if it's one hour of premium pay and you didn't pay it and the employee waits 30 days, that final pay was still wrong. So that's termination, you're fired. That money needs to be in their hot little hands. That is a challenge when you have hybrid folks, when you have remote workers. We have to figure out a way for that person to get their money. So if you have that situation, be aware the rule doesn't change. Doesn't matter where the person works, that money, that check needs to be in their hand um, when you say you're fired. So if somebody comes to you and says, I quit. And you know, today's Tuesday, my last day is Friday. Well, that's more than 72 hours. We have time now before they're at, they leave on Friday to get all of their paperwork, all their final pay, and we can hand it to them on their last day because they gave more than 72 hours notice. Now, if somebody comes in and says, I quit, I'm out of here, and they leave, just walk off the job, you have to pay them their final pay within 72 hours after that notice is given. 72 hours is important. It's clock hours, not business hours. So it doesn't matter if you're closed over the weekend or a holiday, 72 hours starts clicking right then. If somebody quits, you can mail the final wages, all the wages, including vacation or PTO, premium pay, anything that they're owed is due on these timelines. Mail the paycheck only if you get authorization from that employee in writing and make sure you request the address to where they want that mailed. Because then once you put that in the mail, you have that authorization from the employee, you have the address they said to send it to, you're good. Just document it, keep a copy of everything. They can't then say, well, I never got it. It's like, well, okay, here you go. We'll issue it again, but you're not gonna get penalized if you follow all those steps. So again, it's the employee's primary work location. So that's another important thing to put in remote worker policies, especially if you're a hybrid. The primary work location could be your office. So that's where they need to get that final pay. But if the primary work location is the employee's home or some other location, that check needs to be there when they're terminated. So all wages, premium pays, Accrued and unused vacation or PTO all needs to be in that final paycheck. That can be two separate checks. You do not need to pay out paid sick leave. The only time you pay out paid sick leave is when you incorporate it into your PTO program. Those penalties are high. Late final pay, one day's pay for up to 30 days. Commissions are a little different. 
because if you have commissioned employees, you're going to have a written commission plan because you're required by California law to have a written commission plan. In that commission plan, it will identify and define when commission wages are earned. So for example, some, somebody will have a commission agreement and they'll say, we consider commission earned when we get payment from the client and 30 days has elapsed without any uh, refund. So wages then will be earned on that moment and that's when they need to get paid. So you have a little bit of flexibility with commissions, just make sure your commission agreements are clear. Expense reports also. Expense reports typically actually have a three-year statute of limitations. So most people don't wait three years to pay their expenses, but you, it's not the same timeline as wages. So with all this stuff that we're talking about, and it's, it is a lot, but we have a lot of resources here and the fact that you can give us a call with any of these questions, uh, please take advantage of that hotline. But what happens if there's an error, whether the whether your uh, pay stub is incorrect, whether you missed a meal break and didn't get paid for it, um, whether you worked some overtime and it wasn't paid at regular rate of pay. An employee can file a, an action with the labor commissioner's office. There's a three-year statute of limitation on all wages as well as expenses. We can get waiting time penalties if it was a final pay that was late, interest, and the employee has four years to file that claim. So we're looking way ahead and then looking way back and that can multiply very quickly. So you, you wanna try to correct any wage errors as quickly as possible. If you happen to pay be up below minimum wage, so for example, you have a piece rate system that doesn't take into account every minute in that work hour. If you fail to pay minimum wage, it's gonna be $100 per employee and 250 for each subsequent violation. So, and other things can get added onto that. So we do, wage an hour is just an easy way to miss a small amount of payment and owe a lot of money for that little payment. So we wanna make sure people are checking people's time cards. You know, if you look and you're about to prove time cards and you see that somebody missed a meal break, find out why. And if it's because they're like, oh, I just didn't feel like it. Okay, well, I'm going to get that in writing and we're not going to pay you that premium pay. And we're going to remind the employee of your policy and we're going to document that. So if you have the bandwidth to do that, make sure you're kind of paying attention to people's time cards in your timekeeping system. Like if somebody worked overtime and you have a policy that says you're required to request from your supervisor if you're going to work overtime, that's an opportunity to say to the employee, hey, I noticed you worked overtime last week. I never got a request. We'll pay you this time, but I'm telling you, next time you need to request it or you know, there might be other consequences. All right, what's next? It's February already, everybody. Um, happy pre-Valentine's Day to all of you. Um, so ensure all of your employees are properly classified. You know, start with the premise, every single person is a non-exempt employee, and then go from there. Look at your independent contractor agreements. Make sure you don't have some straggler that, you know, decided to be an independent contractor a few years ago, but they're doing the same thing they were doing as an employee. I want to keep an eye on that. So keep it, check out your independent contractor agreements. Review, review all your policies at least once a year and ensure consistency. Again, you know, it's just because somebody works from home doesn't mean that they can send inappropriate pictures to their coworker. They can't be abusive to their coworkers. They have to follow your meal and rest break policy if they're hourly not exempt. Make sure your pay stubs are accurate and follow all those requirements of Labor Code 226 and make sure you have a good system in place for that final pay. Make sure your supervisors and managers know if they have the authority to terminate, they need to make sure that payroll is run before they say you're fired. So make sure people are aware of the potential liability for being late for final pay. Okay, I whizzed through that. I see some questions in the box popping up. Um, you got anything for me, Eli? 
couple last minute ones. One of them was specifically related to um, penalties for unpaid vacation after termination. And of course, that, as we know, is a worker's daily rate for each day up to 30 days would, would, could be what's due. Aside from, is there any uh, other kinds of uh, penalties involved? Any kinds of uh, penalties interest. from the state, of course? Yeah, interest. That's interest. Sort of thing, so. um, the pay stubs will be incorrect, is my guess. Mm -hmm. So um, there's those penalties for that. So yeah, it, it's such a heartbreaker when somebody looks in their payroll a couple of weeks after somebody is terminated and they're like, ah, we missed one missed meal break, you know, and that's 20 bucks. But now that $20 is, you know, 14 days times somebody's regular rate of pay. So yep. not and then that was fairly specific related to um, service charges versus versus commissions versus tips. So that one may be one to call the hotline just just to make sure so we could talk about the specifics of that one, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it really could vary based on how how they're paid out and how they're treated and everything, especially when mm -hmm. it comes to final pay. So give us a call on the hotline for that one just to make sure that we're getting all the all the details and not leaving anything out. Yep. Yeah. Good thoughts. And of course, last one that popped in, sick pay for final checks. As you mentioned, we only pay sick pay if it is included into one PTO bucket for sick and vacation. If you have them separately, no need to pay sick pay on the final check. Correct. Correct. And check policies. Every once in a while, somebody snuck in a policy that says they'll pay out sick leave yep. upon termination. And some people want to do that. They want to be that generous, but you do not have to. So if you don't want to, take that policy out. But yeah, if it is incorporated into a whole PTO bucket. You do have to pay it all out. So Anything we're, else? we're caught up right now. Well, very good. So if we blew your mind or you just want to commiserate with other HR advisors in the world, uh, please give us a call. So this is your hotline number. Thank you, Riverside County Workforce Development Centers and Workforce Development Board. Such amazing services that you provide on your own and then bringing us in to back you up because it's tough to be an employer sometimes. And sometimes it's nice when people call the hotline and they'll just say, I think I'm right. I don't know if I'm right. Can I just talk this out with you for a minute? Because I don't even know where my head is. And we're like, happy to do it. Happy to do it. Let us be here for you. And you know, our mission is to provide employers with peace of mind. So please use that hotline for employers. Oh, and we have, this is our membership. If you need something beyond just the phone service, as far if you know sample forms, toolkits, all those sort of things, um, membership may be an option for you. Oops, wrong way. And if you're continuing your education today, your HRCI code is six four nine two seven five. Your SHRM code is twenty four dash H G P is in Paul, M is in Mary, three. And I'm sure Anna will put that in the chat for you. And because we follow through on our promises, this is that survey. And I've taken it. I think it takes significantly less, Anna. So it's not two minutes. You can do it. Race yourself. Just race yourself. See if you can beat two minutes. But thank you again, Jason and Riverside. And if you guys can close us out, we're good. I mean, I think you covered it, Jessica. So thank you to uh, Jessica and Eli for providing uh, 90 minutes of your expertise here um, and answering so many questions. I, we, I know we had a couple of requests for the Q&A um, since there was such, um, such engagement there. So I will go ahead and pull the report after we're done here. I'll make sure that I send that over to Jason uh, so that when um, he follows up with all of you guys that he makes that information available to you. But since they did uh, generously sponsor today, I want to make sure that I make that information um, available to him as well. So uh, stay tuned for Jason and his team. They will get that information to you right away. Um, please take the survey and we look forward to seeing you guys on the next training. Thank you again to Riverside for sponsoring and thank you all very much for showing up live. And we'll see you again soon. Cheers.